Hi everyone, Ernie Tech here, and we're going to talk about the business end of the VG4 antenna from Seagoo that I bought from Radio Utility um, just a while ago. So this is the matching box that comes with the antenna. The antenna is a vertical end fed, more or less. I mean, essentially that's what it is. It's an end fed antenna. It has these little counter poises here instead of full size radials that you lay on the ground. And that makes it a very tall antenna, which of course requires quite a bit of robustness, at least in these parts here, so that this axial bending, this the total wind driven back and forth, if you don't have this thing completely guide, is going to eventually make itself known probably down here where the first element fits into the PVC insulator. So that's why they have these two through bolts at 90 degrees, which is supposed to create enough strength to resist the axial bending that eventually over time might have something to do with killing this thing. Some people have put, um, uh, you know, rope at the top to keep the thing from moving around. I don't think it's necessary, but hey, you know, your mileage may vary. A couple of problems that I had with uh, assembling this thing, which is why I want to point this out to anybody who might be interested in buying this to be aware. So, I guess over in the manufacturing process, over time, things have slipped a little bit. And if you prototype something, you go through the process of making it work perfectly so you're happy with it. And then you start mass producing parts and then sending them out the door to your customers. But over time, in my Ernie Tech um, experience, over time, these things can slip in terms of their quality control. And I think that's what happened here a little bit. And here's what happened. This is a PVC tube. It's an insulator. This is what keeps the driven element from talking too much to the ground side, as it were. This is where, you know, the electrons don't travel. This is your insulator. This is also where an awful lot of torque is applied during, you know, the, the actual bending. So this is a very important piece down here. And generally, it's a pretty nice, robust unit, except that the interior diameter of this PVC pipe or tubing and the exterior diameter of the first element, which has to go inside, they were not the same. They were not compatible in any way, shape, or form. In fact, they were off by about a half a millimeter. Now, a half a millimeter is huge, in case you're not aware, but it actually is a lot of space. So this element here would not go into this PVC pipe, and I had to resort to sandpaper which I then went in inside and just sanded the inside of this PVC pipe until finally, finally, after about a half an hour of grumbling, there was enough uh, room to slide, and I won't say slide, to convince the driven element to make itself comfortable inside of the inside diameter of that PVC. So, that was not fun. What I had to do was I had to Get it to a point where I just couldn't stand sanding it anymore. I had to bevel the end of this pipe a little bit to get it to start. And then I used a little bit of lithium grease, just a tiny bit, to lubricate the inside of the pipe to get a little extra. And then I used a block of wood <clears throat> and the persuader on the far end to drive this unit Oh my gosh, into the PVC. I was not happy about that, and I really wish that Radiodity would pay a little more attention to what's coming across its, uh, its orders. Anyhow, once I got that in place, and, and another problem, of course, was if this starts to turn as you're tapping it in, you're going to have a problem getting these aligned. These are the three bolt, uh, the bolts that hold it in place. So draw a pencil line, uh, tap, tap, make sure you're not turning. And if you are turning, if this thing is rotating as you're tapping it in, get a piece of tape. Yeah, that's ugly. And you're going to have to get her back into position. I find that to be frustrating. And I believe that new hams who may be inclined to buy um, the antenna are going to be furious about it. So hopefully they fix that, or at least they acknowledge it. All right. The other thing was, is that once I did get everything into place and everything lined up, that the spacing here was perfect so that this matchbox could sit where it needs to be, these holes didn't line up perfectly. They were close. They were doggone close, but they weren't close enough to get the through bolts through. So if you don't have this in your inventory, you need to buy these. These. This is a, uh, a reamer. A couple of shots with the reamer. 
and everything aligned and went in and it was all smooth and groovy unnecessary aggravation but there you have it for three hundred dollars right all right one of the other irritants was this collar now this collar sits by just a compression there's nothing holding it in place well there might be actually i think there might be a little set screw there but not much this collar is where the wire radials if you want to call them that stick out this was not parallel so this little collar was tilted slightly would it make a difference no but if you have the thing up in the air and you notice that that plane of your radials is kind of sad <laughs> you're gonna wish you hadn't put it up you're gonna wish you had fixed this so again something else that you need in your inventory dirt cheap on amazon works like a champ is you need a set of calipers and all i did was to find the sweet spot measure it and then spend some time tap tap tapping in one way or the other until this collar was perfectly parallel to the top of the mounting post so those were the irritants uh, to start with all right talking about the matchbox so this is a half wave end fed antenna by its nature and what they do is they use these radials as it were as counterpoises now, if you know anything about NFET antennas, they've got a couple of drawbacks. They're not that efficient uh, in comparison to, say, a regular dipole. Not too far off, but as you, you'll you find out over time, they're not quite as efficient, to say the least. The other problem with NFET antennas is they can introduce common mode currents onto your coax, which is causing all sorts of grief if that happens to you. You don't want that. So this box here does two things. One of which is it clamps down on the common mode current. So this toroid and this coax running through there clamps down the common mode current. Keep it from coming back to your shack. I'm also going to add about 10 additional clamp-ons uh, on the coax that I bought from Palomar. This being an NFED has a natural um, impedance of around 250-ish ohms. Don't quote me on that, but somewhere in that nature. So to bring the 250-ohm antenna down to a 50-ohm value, you're going to need a matching transformer, which is this guy here, which probably has a ratio of about 1 to 4.5, 6, 7, somewhere in that range. Enough so that what you see at this end, what comes back to your radio, is going to be within the range of happiness uh, that your radio wants to see. Would your tuner match? Sure, your, your tuner will do some matching, but there's another aspect of this to be aware of. So this match box here seems to be the de facto design for a lot of these kinds of antennas, these no radial tall halfway verticals. The Cushcraft R5 comes to mind. Now, is this a clone of the R5? No, it's not a clone of the R5. It's based on the same design, lots of different designs. Uh, the R5 now, I think it's called like the MV5 something something. I don't know. But the R5 is very expensive. The R5 is about, what, $599? This is $300. So we're going to have to expect a couple of uh, compromises here, and, and they definitely have it. There's a little capacitor right here. See this little capacitor right there? That little capacitor right there is, I think, a 47 pico val picofarad value. And that little capacitor is little. So this thing's supposed to handle 1,000 watts. But if you don't do a good job of making this antenna, you know, the right size in each section so your SWR is naturally low, I think you're going to find that this thing here, if you're driving 1,000 watts through it, it's probably going to be the weak link in the big chain of things. That's probably going to pop like popcorn. Uh, again, i just saying that it seems to me, mm, you know, don't send me hate mail. But I don't like this. I think this is sort of cheesy. Uh, I did see a guy online who replaced that with a uh, 47 pico farad doorknob capacitor, which of course is potent. Uh, and it's unnecessary. Somehow or another, G5 uh, K5GP is is in there. I don't know why. I looked him up. It didn't seem like he had anything to do with this design, but maybe he does. Who knows? There's a, a couple of spots here for components which were not included. There's a little jumper on one of them. Uh, one is this RFC, this radio frequency choke, that the more uh, expensive antennas, I think, have. That's missing here. Is it necessary? Probably not, but it's a good thing to have. So that's the design. It's minimal at best. It was designed to be inexpensive so that the antenna's price range was low and to be serviceable. The box itself isn't bad. It's not, you know, it's not the real strong 
ones that we used to get back when we were kids, um, but it'll do the trick, especially when the lid is on because it adds rigidity to it. It's got itself kind of a cheesy little gasket that's dry. I would put a little silicone very carefully applied on both sides to give it a little extra weather resistance because I don't think it's going to survive the weather for a long, long time. It just doesn't seem to me that this is going to live outside in the sun and the rain and the heat and the UV for more than a couple years without this area degrading and water getting in, even though it has a weep hole. But that's not what the purpose of the weep hole is, not to get rid of the water. It's supposed to be to allow for, I guess, um, humidity build up to go somewhere. I don't know. It's a weep hole. The other thing which I found fascinating, um, Radiotity makes this manual. And it's a pretty good manual, except that there was, from what I could see, kind of a glaring omission which I didn't really understand. And the glaring omission was this guy. Where does this strap go? Well, the strap goes to the collar. That's the other side of the circuit. But in the instruction manual, it just has this strap unattached to anything. And then the story ends and they say, go have fun with ham radio. But they have a picture of this strap just kind of laying off in space. Uh, am I missing something? Did you guys read it and I missed it? I mean, I don't. Who knows? I just don't know why they did that. Emissions, man. All right, so that is the business end of the VG4 in all of its glory. Tubes didn't fit. Lots of manual sanding. Couple of reamy things. Misalignment of the collar. Got that squared away. Inside the box is just fine. This is probably sufficient. I would suggest you add some more ferrites downstream, maybe 10. That'll really kill it because once you have this thing up in the air, you don't want to go playing around with it again. Here's the little tiny itty bitty minimalist matching network to give you a 50 ohms output down here. Here's the box. The box is, eh, it's okay. It's not great. It'll do the trick. I would do something to make it a little bit more robust. I would put some silicone around here um, just because that's how I roll. Um, but otherwise, will it last several years? We shall find out. I'm not confident that plastic is not so hot. All right, that is the business end of the VG4 10, 15, 20, and 40 meter vertical dipole without the need of ground radials. Tall as get out, built pretty well um, for 300 bucks from Radiotity. The next video, it will be outside putting it up and trying to get the SWR to, um, to comport with my expectations. All right, subscribe if you must somewhere on the button. I don't know where it's at. And I'll talk to you soon. Bye.